Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to Profiles. Our guest is Dr. George Semmel, an eminent board-certified plastic surgeon who practiced in Beverly Hills. Welcome, George. How are you? I'm glad you're here. Where did you go to school? I've never known that. Well, my education really began in high school. I went to the High School of Music and Art in New York, which was uh, the equivalent of a magnet school out here in those times. Uh, but I had the good luck to uh, be in, in a very good place at that time because uh, uh, many successful people came through that school. Uh, Peter Yarrow and, both, and Billy D. Williams were both in my homeroom, as was Eddie Cleveland, who did the lyrics of Chorus Line. And you, did you ever think of being an artist or a sculptor? That was the intent. Uh, because my father was working and that was quite <laughs> fine. <laughs> so you could do whatever you wanted to do. Then I went to college. I went to Columbia as an undergrad and I was an English major there, uh, which also was fine. Uh, but in, in my junior year of, of college, my father died and reality set in. Oh. And I switched to pre-med because I figured that I had to do something with what I had going for me uh, as a person. And I thought I would either go into psychiatry from the English or go into plastic surgery. I had never met a plastic surgeon. I'd heard, of, I'd heard of it, but never really met anybody. I knew such things were done. And uh, from there, I went to Boston University School of Medicine. And there was a plastic surgeon on faculty. Uh, <laughs> oh, so you were going not to be a plastic surgeon. You were just going to be a doctor or well, a psychiatrist. Well, the, 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 the proper training of a plastic surgeon, at least in my time, was such that after medical school, you did a year of internship, you did general surgery, then you did plastic surgery. Oh, so then you, you specialize. Now you don't have to do that? Well, in, in those days, when there were 60-odd members in the California Society of Plastic Surgeons, they <laughs> scanned for talent. <laughs> <laughs> and they felt if you had good hands that you shouldn't be doing appendectomies and gallbladders. And you, and know, you did have surgery. good hands because you were in the arts. So. I would like to believe that. <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, the difference between cosmetic and reconstructive uh, surgery? Reconstructive surgery has substantially gone by the boards. It, it still exists, and I have some very exotic things to show you in relationship to that. Huh. But uh, with the change of the window glass, with seat belts, with airbags, the severe, terrible things that would happen in the automobile have stopped. Oh, that's, that's actually really good. I think it's wonderful. I know. I uh, and it isn't that I'm too lazy to get up at night, but I mean, it's very good not to have those procedures. The other thing that happened is that uh, in our return to classical thinking, we now do amnio. So the children who are genetically unlikely to come out well oh. uh, are now prevented. Uh, this came from a very sensitive position. When I was in medical school, everybody that could be saved was saved. People whose hearts were on the wrong side, people who didn't have uh, esophaguses hooked up, the most severe problems were, were saved. Uh, spina bifida that became little eggs in wheelchairs. And uh, many of them were highly intellectual, nice people who lived with their deformity well, but they felt that it would be better not to have been born. And so they gave support uh, to the actual prevention of some of the severe deformities. So when you talk about amnio, that takes place before birth, and, and that also keeps that reconstructive plastic surgery at a low, the same as yes. all the other things that you it's were talking about? Excuse me. It's, it's not only about Mongols. It, it's about it's about severe deformities. It's about life limiting factors. But there's another aspect to reconstructive surgery. Um, today, uh, you can go and have a CAT scan, and they can make a model of your skull. I, I brought three such models just Did to you? show you. Well, then, are, are we talking? Do we still call it reconstructive, or do we call it cosmetic at this point? Well, let me show you a true reconstructive one. Okay. Uh, this was a young man who was in a severe accident. And he's a nice boy. And he's not, a, he was not well, he, we, did, we finished him. So he, he's a, attractive at this time. Uh, but he uh, shows pictures of himself at 16 and at 20 something. Says, you know, I've been in a severe accident and I really don't look right. And if you look closely, I don't know if camera will show, he's got dents 
in here where, to his cheekbones in a very odd place. And are these marks, these marks show where the dents are? Uh, actually, no? these marks were made by the people who made the models to show where muscles are. I see. But the dents are here and here. And his nose uh, was very badly damaged in the accident. You can see that his uh, orbits, his, the, the sockets that his eyes sit in, are, are very different. This one is much smaller than that one. Oh, I, I don't know see. if the camera can get this. Mm -hmm. And so what we did is we took wax and filled in to make a custom implant for him. Next, right next to the bone, obviously, right? Well, it's a very interesting, uh, you've heard of lost wax for jewelry. Yes. It's very similar. Yes. I, I'm going to use white wax. It doesn't photograph the best, but I can mold it quickly for a camera. You make the piece that's missing. And of course, you don't make it as quickly as this, but you make it an idealized situation. So you fill in that. Yes. You're filling in that. Or, and you're also giving it shape, the shape yes. that you want. Then you bring the patient <laughs> back in. Oh. And the two of you do it together because, you know, when I was, when I was in medical school, I used to do portraits. I, I needed the money, <laughs> and it was fun to do. And I, I still have the same attitude. You can't, they have to like it. Whether I like it, whether I like it doesn't really matter, is do they That's like true. it? And you really want the patient's input. A as it happened, we made this fellow's um, uh, mold several times, and we came up with something, not, not this, but something that was, was suitable. Does it change the shape that much that he has to really go along with what you want? It's not really just filling in those empty spots. It's really making a new structure. You can do things. There is a patient I have uh, who I'm not allowed to show photos of uh, who really wanted to look like a different person. He would have liked Schwarzenegger, but he would have settled for a Calvin Klein model look. <laughs> and he, he had a round face, and they don't have round faces. Right. And we were able to lengthen his face. I brought his model here. Oh, you have uh, it with you? Yes. Oh, great. But no names. I, I did this no, in I red. No, you don't want to say any names. You don't want to say names of the celebrities you do. Or This is not a celebrity, but he's a, <laughs> a person. He's got a right to privacy. This, in, this, in this particular case, we lengthened the jaw. And we, we built up a chin. And I'm going to destroy this now and show you what he had. He'd had multiple surgeries before. He had some unevenness. He had a, a, a cut where the jaw was advanced, but it didn't hold. Does it show through the skin? No. It's no. all underneath. It's all underneath. You would all be seeing that. And so you can see that we changed his look tremendously from this to... You widened it and made it made longer? It, he looks like an entirely different person. We added like... Uh, three or four millimeters to the length of his face, and that makes a big difference, as you can see. And is he modeling today? <laughs> or is well, he jumping happy. from buildings? <laughs> he's, the thing is that he is a, he's a substantial man. He's a businessman. He's not a model. He's not uh, flighty. He's a regular guy. You know, you talk about he's happy. I think uh, so many people come and think that plastic surgery or cosmetic surgery is going to make their lives happy. Does that always happen? Or do you, do you send people for some kind of therapy before they go into surgery? Or are you the uh, at-home doctor? You don't have to be crazy to have plastic <laughs> surgery. I mean, really not. But, uh, I mean, there but are you unstable... Know, some people do come and say, I'm unhappy with my life if I have my face done, lifted, or my eyes done, or whatever. I'm going to be a happier person. But it's really some, a, a problem that's deeper. Well, no, the deeper problems you can sense, and, and they should not have surgery, at least not without a lot of support, and the surgery doesn't help them. But there are people who truly have problems. I mean, these are true physical problems. Right. And where there is a physical problem that you, can, that you can see, and that you can photograph, and that you can agree upon, and there's a way to treat, then, then that's okay. What age limit, what age group, I should say, comes in for certain types of things? certain types of surgeries? Well, these two models, you know, these, are, these are quite young people. And uh, to me, you know, young is between 20 and 30. I think that's young in anybody's right. point. But what, uh, time, what age do they start coming in to you? The, the beginning of the fraying starts around 35, depending upon how much sun you've had and, and how your life has been. And I would say that it stops in the 80s. Is that right? You, you do surgery on people all the way up to that age? There's no limit on age? Well, I haven't done, the oldest person I've done is 92. <laughs> As spans increase, I would expect to see older people. Uh, somebody came in at 85 who said, you know, I never thought I'd see you again. I thought I'd really d I'd been done right. with this at 65. But as it turns out, I'm very healthy. I have to work. I retired. There isn't enough money anymore. And I'm able-bodied and I'm happy. And what happens is somebody who's in really good shape, who doesn't look 85, who's then having a facelift at 85 and goes back into the workforce, they lie quietly because they don't have a peer group. 
But the, the thing with someone at that age, if they come, they've been to you for surgery, obviously, before. Oh, yes. I mean, so they've been, say, I don't know, from their 50s up? It starts when you need it. Um, what what the, the American Society of Plastic Surgery did a study some years ago, which is holding up very well. The people who are done a little earlier have shorter incisions, that you get more skin off, oh. and it lasts longer. It does. So that first lift can last a very, very long time, unless you're in show business and you really are being scrutinized closely. But if you're in civilian life, then a, a good lift can last a very long time. So we really can't put an age on what when a person should come in for a lift, actually, because you have to see them that skin breaks down at d different ways. and. Well, you've got your own genetic clock. Everybody ages a little <laughs> differently. Uh -huh. Also, it depends on how much sun. Mm -hmm. That uh, makes a big difference? Well, you know, when you see a patient, you don't just say, well, let's operate and catch you next time. Mm -hmm. we, what, what we try to do is we put them on vitamins. If they'll, do, if they'll listen and, and follow, we put them on, on the antioxidants. This is before, then? Before and after. Or this is when they just come in to see you? Uh, you know, a plastic surgeon wants you to live a very long time to look the very best you can and to get the most mileage out of the work. I mean, we do not live off illness. We are preventative on many, many levels. Uh, you need to give people dietary advice uh, so that they are, they are stable. If you, for example, if you take chromium, your sugar craving, cravings will go down. I mean, they won't be perfect, but they will go down. The multiple minerals seem to curb appetite, and I can't explain the mechanism, but if you take them regularly over a period of time, if you're on a high fruit diet, will lower cholesterol. That's what it, you were talking about, your berries and melon diet. I think that probably just goes along with what you're talking about, no fat, vitamins and minerals. How does that affect the face or the skin? Well, you don't want to go to any extreme. The, the only time we go to anything that would be considered an extreme is that when somebody is, is recovering from a facelift, I like them to be on fruit juice. And the reason for this is there's lots of vitamins, there is no salt, and there's lots of fluid to wash away the swelling. Oh, that's what happens. Because if you go on soups and things, when you reach for the can or, or if you prepare it, there's a little salt, there's a little this and that, which will make you swell. But if you went on an extreme diet, I mean, you could get very, very sick. I, you know, I don't advocate excluding anything for any length of time. The post-op period is a very special time because in the first three days, you, you are retaining sodium, you're losing potassium. The fruit juice fits into that. That's okay. But not as a lifetime way. I mean, not even as a diet. A, a diet needs to be high in protein and high in fruit and vegetables. The other thing that um, I think one of the things you said about the diet is that should be all, all the time, should be on those diets all the time. And if we're on those diets, on the diet that you're suggesting all the time, will, will our <laughs> face lose its puffiness and stop sagging? Well, for example, if you went on multiple minerals, the, cr the cravings that make people get off uh, good food in, into bad food seem to go away. Mm. And if you use something like glycolic acid or Retin-A on a regular basis, and I would say starting at 20, long before you need a plastic surgeon, uh, you will curtail the aging process because it's, the exfoliation seems to keep the skin smooth. And you want sunscreens, as, although the government says 15, I, re, I recommend 50s because I think more is more. And the reason more is more is that when you're out and about, some of it wears off. And mm -hmm. second of all, not everybody puts on as thick a coat as you need. And so if you're putting a 15 on thin, it's not as effective as a 50 put on thin, because that 50 thin is probably a 30. Well, I'm going to go for 50 thin, and I'm going <laughs> to wait till you come back again. Our time is up, and we thank you very much for being with us. Uh, George Semmel uh, was with us today, and when we come back, we'll have someone who's just as interesting as he is and who can talk just as much as George. So don't go away. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with Cordelia Francis Biddle, who is the daughter of novelist Livingston Biddle, Jr. <laughs> Livingston helped draft the legislation that created the National Endowment for the Arts, and during the Carter administration, served as its chairman. Cordelia can trace her bloodline back to 1681, <laughs> where you'll hear names like Drexel and Duke. Her family has founded universities, served in the government, and been just downright social. And part of being social is to attend the right private schools. Cordelia went to Shipley, Miss Porter's, and Vassar. 
She lived for a time in Italy and was raised on Philadelphia's main line. Welcome, Cordelia. Thank you, Joan. It's <laughs> quite an introduction. <laughs> well, tell me what uh, living on Philadelphia's main line really means. Well, uh, the main line is the most social part of Philadelphia's uh, suburbs, I guess. Um, is it a streetcar line? <laughs> yes, it's a streetcar <laughs> line. Uh, we think of it, however, as being very Tony. Uh, there's another side of Philadelphia, which is Chestnut Hill, but um, Phil Philadelphia really considers that the main line is the most Tony. Is area. that actually the name, Main Line? Yes, That's the, main the line. area. My so father wrote a book called Main Line. So it's like Beverly Hills? Is exactly, that the exactly, name? exactly. Uh, I see. But the main line consists of Bryn Mawr and Haverford and all sorts of little towns in between. But if you say you live on the main line, which hopefully you don't do too often. <laughs> you don't say that? <laughs> well, it's it's a little snobbish, I think. So what do you say? I live in Philly? <laughs> uh, um, I say I used to. <laughs> <laughs> well, how long was it then before the rebellion set in and you wanted to leave uh, on the main line? I, I guess it was forever. Um, I can't really remember ever thinking that it was the place to be. I think because we lived in Italy when I was five, I became just... Uh, transfixed by Italy and only spoke Italian when I came home and um, then had to learn English again. Did it stay with you? Well, the being able to understand it has stayed with me. Uh, I can't speak it as well as I'd like to, but I can understand and I can get by. So when you left Philadelphia yes, uh, and you ran off to New York, so yes. to say, did you run off to, to school or? Well, I wanted to be an actress. And I decided that I was not going to be, in fact, discovered on the Paoli Local, which runs through the main line. Uh, I think that's probably a wise assessment. And I went to New York to study acting and did that and was in a lot of very bad off-off Broadway plays. How did you... Terrible, actually, off-off Broadway. How did you get into uh, off-Broadway plays from just going to, just going uh, to audition school? And yeah, and auditioning. Just See. audition and audition and audition, and I did so many bad auditions. I did one at the public theater where I, uh, oh gosh, um, I went up on my lines and forgot what monologue I was doing, forgot whether it was classical, modern, comedy, drama, and then I forgot my name. <laughs> I, listen, that's not so, I always write my name down on my cue cards. I'm very to smart. Make, to make sure I know who I am. <laughs> now I was completely lost, and at the end, I walked into a wall because I was so nervous. God just deserted me there and left me alone. I'll tell you, but, but it was just a process of acting classes and auditions and going, um, going to auditions that got you on yes. stage? Because yes. it's so tough to try and break in there. Yes, and I did some terrible work, as I said. Uh, one memorable one was um, a play called... Heiderzad about an Afghani sculptor and the Afghani sculptor himself uh, played played himself <laughs> and uh, didn't speak any English so we had to teach him his lines phonetically. Oh that's great. <laughs> it was really um, it was something. It well, was probably the low point of my career. <laughs> while you were living your low points in, in New York, I think you were doing kind of these scandalous things, like getting tattoos. Trying to. <laughs> trying to. <laughs> you did get tattoos way, yes. back, way back then. Yes. It was pretty scandalous, wasn't it? Uh, it was as much as I could figure out. Um, I did the, the, actually, the first tattoo I got, I was doing a play in Philadelphia with Jerry Zachs. Uh, the director, who um, we were cast out of New York, and I had, as as usual, Monday off in the theater. So I thought, well, what could I do with my Monday? What what would be <laughs> really fun? And there was a great tattoo artist in Philadelphia named Philadelphia Eddie. <laughs> and I went down to Vine and I don't know where. It was not an area that I really knew very well, not a place that my grandmother, per se, would have visited. And uh, I wanted to have um, a moth because of a poem by Percy Bysshe Shelley. So you see, I was rebellious, but I still did like my romantic poets. I was going to say, you're still a conservative in there, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> Even though you didn't wear your pearls today? No, no, no. I And, uh, and I got them off, and uh, it, was, it was painful, and um, I fainted a couple of times, <laughs> but I persisted and got them off, and then invited Philadelphia Eddie to see the play, but he neglected to. 
show up. Is that kind of like Philly steak sandwich or something yes. like that? <laughs> I don't know what else you would talk about there. <laughs> well, he was a kind of an odd guy, but I guess tattoo artists are fairly difficult. Then did you go back to New York and um, get a role in One Life to Live? Yes. Was that yes. right after that? Just about, yeah. I um, found that I love working in the theater and I was very, very happy doing this show, but I had three children and working in the theater is something you have to do one thing or another. I found that um, being a mom didn't afford me as much time and I had to turn down roles. Mm. And my agent finally said, are you a mother or uh, an actress? So uh. I, I decided to do the soap. <laughs> I know that sounds awful because it sounds oh, like I wasn't an actress. Uh, well, but then you decided uh, to do the soap? <laughs> yes. Well, I, it's a, you know, it's a nine to five job, right. or it's actually a six to nine job. Right. Um, and, and you have your holidays and, and actually you can be a family. And did you have a husband there with your three children? No. I was oh, you I were? ditched my first husband, left him in Philadelphia, where he still is. Oh. And uh, so I was alone living the bohemian life in New York. You really were. Well, were you living on your mainline trust? Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I uh, was married to quite a wealthy man the first time, and I uh, absconded with all my jewelry. Nothing else but a lot of jewelry. <laughs> did that get you through your, did. your hungry day? Oh, did it, it did. Really? I sold uh, one ring and bought an apartment. Oh, well, good for you. Yeah, I did very well with these things. Yes. I walked up and down 47th Street, and it was quite a nice diamond, and I, this is as like you see, it's and not here anymore. <laughs> this is uh, the focus <laughs> in and out, right? Yeah. Sounds pretty good. <laughs> then when did you actually start writing? I started writing while I was working on the soap. I had the idea for this novel. I'd grown up with photographs of this original voyage on the yacht Alcido. And I had this in my mind for a long time, what these people must have been doing. I grew up hearing these stories of this extraordinary adventure in 1903. Uh, but I didn't know anything more about it other than the photographs. So I started doing historical research, and um, that led to the book. And the yacht was in your family, yes, is that yes, right? Yes, yes. And whatever happened to that yacht? Oh, she was commandeered by the government during World War I. And Oh, blew up. so this, the remains of the yacht are in Beneath the Wind, yes. your novel. Yes, yes, um, you, you go through the book and you talk about all, I think a lot of the people in your family. Well, sort of. But we're not supposed to know they're in your family? <laughs> no. Oh, I see. But wasn't, wasn't one of your uncles a commander in the Navy? Yes, yes, but that's... Is he involved No, here? no, that was way long ago because he, in fact, died during the War of 1812. He was one of the first naval heroes during the War of 1812. Um, but did you feel funny writing about your family, kind of a family that you had more or less left to go to the big city? No, no, I really didn't. Um, I felt that they were my history, and uh, at that time my grandmother had died. I'd inherited all of the portraits and the family uh. things because I was the only girl. And I felt in a way that I was giving them homage, although sometimes not in the kindest way, I guess. <laughs> but, but pretty honest. Yes. And yes. were those all from stories that you had heard? Yes, and, yes. Um, give us a rundown, kind of. Well, it's a big romantic adventure story. I will say probably more adventurous than romantic. Um, when I started doing my research, I found that the oil industry was nascent in 1903, and I, that fascinated me. Hmm. Uh, the Nobels were, Nobel family were pumping oil in Baku in the Caspian Sea. The Rothschilds were there as well. Uh, Shell Oil Company was just starting up. Really? And I wondered why these people had gone to Borneo and some of these strange places. And I began to think that some of the research, in fact, perhaps they were some of these family members, robber barons. Um, mm. won't mince words, and right. um, maybe there were some deals going on. Did you go to Borneo? Yes, I did. You did? I and did. And how much time did you spend there? Well, I was very fortunate because I was able to go on this incredible uh, Cunard ship called the Sea Goddess, which was about the same size <gasps> as the as yacht. the yacht? Yes. Oh, 300, please. 300 feet, eating caviar. It was fabulous, and I thought, this is how my ancestors traveled Wow. And I would like to see it 
from their perspective. And I floated up the river in Borneo, the Sungai Sarawa, on this white ship. And it was oh. so haunting because I couldn't tell whether I was returning as my character mm -hmm. to this place or whether I was the writer or whether I, this, none of this had happened yet. It was a very odd, odd sensation. Really? Deja vu continually. Really? I mean, I think you, you were possessed. I was. In a I way, was. right? I, I never slept. The captain was very kind. He let me come up into the wheelhouse and go through all the charts. And uh, that, it was riveting. Were, were stories starting to come back to you that you had heard from before when yes. you were? Yes, yes. And in fact, when we were in uh, Borneo, going along the coast of Borneo, it's still so dangerous that we had to take on militia. And oh. I thought, what was it, if this was like this now, what was it like in 1903? Yeah. When we were on the South China Sea, I saw there were, it seemed like there were fires, a lot of fires. Yes. Did, did that? Yes. Well, in fact, there was a, there was a town called Api Api, which in Malaysian means fire, fire. Ah. And I don't know whether there, uh, it's, there's a lot of phosphorescence in the water, whether that kindled, I don't know. I don't know, I'm not but a scientist. it was pretty weird, wasn't yes, it, to be yes. going very smoothly at night, and then you see yes. in the distance a fire just yes. starting? Yes, yeah. Well, I think that's absolutely, that whole process. And then did you come home and ride it all, or were you riding it I while you were I was riding while I was there. Um, I knew that my novel has, was exploding to a certain extent there in Borneo. So uh, I did an awful lot of research and then just was filled with ideas. They just kind of came flying out of me. I love the way you said um, that the book was really finished and well done at the end because the copywriters know how to punctuate. <laughs> <laughs> I can't punctuate worth a darn, and that <laughs> nor <was> spell. <laughs> and why? <laughs> oh, I guess that uh, mainline education. <laughs> you said you never finished college. <laughs> no, I was at college for one semester only. I went to Vassar College, and having gone to all girls' schools, I said, Really, if I'm going to waste my time in an all-girls school, I might as well waste it being married. <laughs> so that's what you did. <laughs> Before we go, I think being married and talking about your other book, Caring for Your Cherished Possessions, yes. is absolutely so conservative and so, I don't know, social. I just well, think it's you know, really funny. Well, it's interesting because a friend of mine and I, Mary Levenstein, and I wrote this book together, and I was working on the novel while we were working on this, but we both had inherited these wonderful pieces, and we had no idea how to take care of them. It and was almost like going back to your roots when I was reading yes, it. I felt yeah. like you were, and that's probably what it was when you said you inherited. There's something about how to take care of your American hooked rug. Yes, yes. Your, your patchwork quilt. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, gloves and jewelry? Yes, and up until then, I had, in fact, gotten so disgusted with uh, all the, the damask and linens that I'd inherited <laughs> that I kept leaving them at, at the cleaners and, and not picking them up because I didn't know what to do with them, and I was throwing Baccarat glasses uh, out of the window in New York. It was just awful to think about it. Because <laughs> you didn't want to wash them or you didn't know how to wash them. I didn't know what to do with them. Don't put them in the dishwasher. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Throw them out the window.